Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for August 17th, and we are finishing the book of Nehemiah today in the Old Testament, starting uh, in chapter 12, verse 27. During the dedication of the new wall of Jerusalem, the Levites throughout the land were asked to come to Jerusalem to assist in the ceremonies. They were to take part in the joyous occasion with their songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, lyres, and harps. The singers were brought together from Jerusalem and its surrounding villages and from the villages of the Netophathites. They also came from Beth Gilgal and the area of Geba and Asmaveth, for the singers had built their own villages around Jerusalem. The priests and Levites first dedicated themselves, then the people, the gates, and the wall. I led the leaders of Judah to the top of the wall and organized two large choirs to give thanks. One of the choirs proceeded southward along the top of the wall to the Dung Gate. Um, Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah followed them, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the priests who played trumpets. Then came Zechariah, son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zakur, a descendant of Asaph. And finally came Zechariah's colleagues, Shemaiah, Azarel, Milaiah, Gilaiah, and Mai, Nethanel, Judah, and Hanani. They used the musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. Ezra the scribe led this procession. At the fountain gate, they went straight up the steps on the ascent of the city wall toward the city of David. They passed the house of David and then proceeded to the water gate on the east. The second choir went northward, around the other way, to meet them. I followed them with the other half of the people along the top of the wall, past the Tower of the Ovens to the Broad Wall, then past the Ephraim Gate to the Old City Gate, past the Fish Gate and the Tower of Hananel, and went on to the Tower of the Hundred. Then we continued on to the Sheep Gate and stopped at the Guard Gate. The two choirs that were giving thanks then proceeded to the Temple of God where they took their places. So did I, together with the group of leaders who were with me. We went together with the trumpet-playing priests, Eliakim, Messiah, Minamin, Micaiah, Elo Elonai, Zechariah, and Hananiah, and the singers, Messiah, um, Messiah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzai, Jehonanan, Melchijah, Elam, and Ezer. They played and sang loudly and clearly under the direction of Jez Jezariah, the choir director. Many sacrifices were offered on that joyous day, for God had given the people cause for great joy. The women and children also participated in the celebration, and the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away. On that day, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the gifts, the first part of the harvest, and the tithes. They were responsible to collect these from the fields as required by the law for the priests and Levites, for all the people of Judah valued the priests and Levites and their work. They performed the service of their God in the service of purification as required by the laws of David and his son Solomon, and so did the singers and the gatekeepers. The custom of having choir directors to lead the choirs in hymns of praise and thanks to God began long ago in the days of David and Asaph. So now, in the days of Zerubbabel and of Nehemiah, the people brought a daily supply of food for the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Levites. The Levites, in turn, gave a portion of what they received to the priests, the descendants of Aaron. On that same day, as the book of Moses was being read, the people found a statement which said that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be permitted to enter the assembly of God, for they had not been friendly to the Israelites when they left Egypt. Instead, they hired Balaam to curse them, though our God turned this curse into a blessing. When this law was read, all those of mixed ancestry were immediately expelled from the assembly. Before this had happened, Eliashib, the priest, who had been appointed a supervisor of the storerooms of the temple of our God, and who was also a relative of Tobiah, had converted a large storeroom and placed it at Tobiah's disposal. The room had previously been used for storing the grain offerings, frankincense, tithes of grain, new wine, oil, and the special portions set aside 
for the priests. Moses had decreed that these offerings belong to the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers. Now, in order to understand the degree of transgression that Eliashib, the priest, has undertaken here, we need to remember who Tobiah was. And several chapters ago, we read that uh, he was one of the primary enemies of Israel in rebuilding the wall. And so Eliashib has allowed him, um, who is also an Ammonite, who they've just read is not even allowed to be in the assembly of God, to literally move into the temple of the Lord and take up residence in one of the holy places. So Nehemiah writes, I was not in Jerusalem at that time, for I had returned to the king in the 32nd year of the reign of King Artaxerxes of Babylon. Remember, he was his cupbearer, though I later received his permission to return. When I arrived back in Jerusalem and learned the extent of this evil deed of Eliashib, that he had provided Tobiah with a room in the courtyards of the temple of God, I became very upset and threw all of Tobiah's belongings from the room. Then I demanded that the rooms be purified, and I brought back the utensils for God's temple, the grain offerings, and the frankincense. I also discovered that the Levites had not been given what was due to them. So they and the singers who were to conduct the worship services had all returned to work their fields. I immediately confronted the leaders and demanded, why has the temple of God been neglected? Then I called all the Levites back again and restored them to their proper duties. And once more, all the people of Judah began bringing their tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the temple storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the, the scribe, and Pedaiah, one of the Levites, in charge of the storerooms. And I appointed Hanan, son of Zakur, and grandson of Mataniah as their assistant. These men had an excellent reputation, and it was their job to make honest distributions to their fellow Levites. Remember this good deed, O oh my God, and do not forget all that I have faithfully done for the temple of my God. One Sabbath day, I saw some men of Judah treading their wine presses. They were also bringing in bundles of grain and loading them on their donkeys. And on that day, they were bringing their wine, grapes, figs, and all sorts of produce to Jerusalem to sell. So I rebuked them for selling their produce on the Sabbath. There there were also some men from Tyre bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise. They were selling it on the Sabbath to the people of Judah and in Jerusalem at that. So I confronted the leaders of Judah. Why are you profaning the Sabbath in this evil way? Wasn't it enough that your ancestors did this sort of thing so that our God brought the present troubles upon us and our city? Now you are bringing even more wrath upon the people of Israel by permitting the Sabbath to be desecrated in this way. So I commanded that from then on, the gates of the city should be shut as darkness fell every Friday evening, not to be opened until the Sabbath ended. I also sent some of my own servants to guard the gates so that no merchandise could be brought in on the Sabbath day. The merchants and tradesmen with a variety of wares camped outside, camped outside Jerusalem once or twice, but I spoke sharply to them and said, what are you doing out here camping around the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. And that was the last time they came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and to guard the gates in order to preserve the holiness of the Sabbath. Remember this good deed also, O oh my God, have compassion on me according to your great and unfailing love. About the same time, I realized that some men from Judah had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Even worse, half their children spoke in the language of Ashdod or some other people and could not speak the language of Judah at all. So I confronted them and called curses down on them. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I made them swear before God that they would not let their children intermarry with the pagan people of this land. Wasn't this exactly what led King Solomon of Israel into sin, I demanded. There was no king from any nation who could compare to him, and God loved him and made him king over all Israel. But even when he was led, but even he was led into sin by his foreign wives. How could you even think of committing this sinful deed and acting unfaithfully toward God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, had married a daughter of Sanballat, the, the Horonite. He's the, another enemy that we heard about earlier in this book. So I banished him from my presence. 
Remember them, O my God, for they have defiled the priesthood and the promises and the vows of the priests and Levites. So I purged out everything foreign and assigned tasks to the priests and Levites, making certain that each knew his work. I also made sure that the supply of food for the altar was brought at the proper times and that the first part of the harvest was collected for the priests. Remember this in my favor, O my God. And that is the end of the book of Nehemiah. And it just strikes me that there are such personal applications that we can take from that, that even once the walls are secure, sin can still creep in, right? And we have to periodically purify our lives of that sin that so easily besets us. 1 Corinthians 11. And you, Corinthians, should follow my, Paul's, example, just as I follow Christ. I am so glad, dear friends, that you always keep me in your thoughts and are you are following the Christian teachings I passed on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. A man is responsible to Christ. A woman is responsible to her husband and Christ is responsible to God. A man dishonors Christ if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her husband if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all of her hair. And since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, then she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for a man is God's glory made in God's own image. But woman is the glory of man. For the first man didn't come from women, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for woman's benefit, but woman was made for him. So a woman should wear a covering on her head as a sign of authority because the angels are watching. But in relationships among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, all men have been born from women ever since and everything comes from God. What do you think about this? Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't it obvious that long hair is a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, all I can say is that we have no other custom than this, and all the churches of God feel the same way about it. Psalm 35, a Psalm of David. O Lord, oppose those who oppose me. Declare war on those who are attacking me. Put on your armor and take up your shield. Prepare for battle and come to my aid. Lift up your spear and javelin and block the way of my enemies. Let me hear you say, I am your salvation. Humiliate and disgrace those trying to kill me. Turn them back in confusion. Blow them away like chaff in the wind, a wind sent by the angel of the Lord. Make their path dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Although I did them no wrong, they laid a trap for me. Although I did them no wrong, they dug a pit for me. So let sudden ruin overtake them. Let them be caught in the snare they set for me. Let them fall into destruction in the pit they dug for me. Then I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be glad because he rescues me. I will praise him from the bottom of my heart. Lord, who can compare with you? Who else rescues the weak and helpless from the strong? Who else protects the poor and needy from those who want to rob them? Malicious witnesses testify against me. They accuse me of things about. They repay me with evil for the good I do. I am sick with despair. Yet when they were ill, I grieved for them. I even fasted and prayed for them, but my prayers returned unanswered. I was sad as though they were my own friends or family, as if I were grieving for my own mother. But they are glad now that I am in trouble. I'm in trouble. They gleefully join together against me. I am attacked by people I don't even know. They hurl slander at me continually. They mock me with the worst kinds of profanity and they snarl at me. Proverbs 21, 17 and 18. Those who love pleasure become poor. Wine and luxury are not the way to riches. Some, sometimes the wicked are punished to save the godly and the treacherous for the upright. 
And to end today, we're going to finish off the chapter in John Ortberger's book, The Life You've Always Wanted, called The Guided Life. And that is seeking the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives. And so far, we have talked about um, the importance of listening, um, asking and listening, and not just asking in big things, but asking in little things. And he did give us that challenge, um, and I don't know if I'll be able to find it exactly to read it to you, but basically that when we meet people this week, we could ask the Lord, you know, how would, how would you have me to respond to this person? So maybe you have been doing that already. So yesterday we talked about listening for the Spirit continually, and today be relentlessly responsive. Guidance makes sense only for people who are resolved to respond. Responding begins, of course, with obedience to God's clear guidance from Scripture. Frank Laubach made his life an experiment in listening for the guiding voice of God. He played what he called games with minutes to see whether he could continually turn back his mind to the Spirit. He wrote about the connection between surrender and guidance. As for me, I never lived. I was half dead. I was a rotting tree until I reached the place where I wholly, with utter honesty, resolved and then re-resolved that I would find God's will and I would do that will, though every fiber in me said no and I would win the battle in my thoughts. It was as though some deep artisan well had been, artesian well had been struck in my soul. Money, praise, poverty, opposition, these make no difference, for they will all alike be forgotten in a thousand years. But this spirit, which comes to a mindset upon continuous surrender, this spirit is timeless life. We should be determined that as best we can, we will be responsive to God's leadings. If we feel a prompting to write a note or make a call, we must follow through. If we have a sense that God wants us to encourage someone, we must say the word. And he also encourages us to listen to the Spirit's voice in the words of others. God speaks not only to us, but through us. Scripture is full of accounts of God's message being pronounced through human agency. At times, even the speaker was unaware of it. Paul said we are to speak to each other in spirit-guided wisdom. And he encourages us to practice listening in small matters. Much of the adventure of Christian living involves responsiveness to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This guidance is not restricted to momentous decisions. It is learned mainly as we practice it on a continuing basis. This means that sometimes it may involve God's gracious attention to small details. And he warns against the tremendous temptation that can exist to use the authority of thus saith the Lord as a way to manipulate people in settings where such authority is unlikely to be questioned, right? We've all experienced that. The Lord gave me this message for you, you know, or this is what I feel the Lord is saying. So there's good reason to be cautious about claiming God's direct guidance too casually. However, we cannot be transformed if we close ourselves off to the guiding power of the Holy Spirit. We must come to believe, mind-stretching as it sounds, that God really can and does personally attend to us. As long as we are going to pray to the God who spoke the creation into being, who communicated to prophets and priests and kings and ordinary people, who wrote a thousand-page book we know as the Bible, and who refers to his son as the word made flesh, then surely we accept the possibility that sometimes he may want to get in a word or two with us. Hmm. Hope that encourages you to listen to and be responsive to the spirit as we go throughout this day. Have a beautiful day. Love you all.